And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We are on what I, I believe this would be the... I believe this would be the penultimate chapter of Heavens and Heresies, at least so far. Penultimate for the artistry, spells, and equipment section. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the encounter is uh, near finished by the time Actually, we finish I forgot. Piece. I forgot about the encounter -ary, so yeah, I take back what I said about the about penultimate. Um, it is, but it is. We are we are one week we are one week away from and from getting out of the second half of Holiday Hell and getting out of um, Whamageddon and the Mariah Apocalypse. I hope some of you have survived it so far, unless you're in retail, in which case give up now, or you pro or you probably were already sent to Whamhalla. Not to pick then, anybody doing retail, but if you're playing Whamageddon and you work retail anywhere, give up. You have no <laughs> chance. And then you have me posting hard-based Christmas songs from guys like Alan Aztec or Celtic Christmas songs from... Ah, uh, man. I'll Monk. take I'll take those I'll take those over over suffering holiday hell music. I know. Cole, Cole McGinnis does great work with his uh with his shanties and folk songs. It sh straight up sang in Gaelic. So, Cole. well, with a name like Cole McGinnis, it better be. Pretty sure he actually lives in that region. <laughs> oh. Now, I would. I um, I would like to I would like to to delve into something I, sp I spoke about on social media and and Zan and I had talked about when we when we were when we were getting set up and that is a comment that I that I made partially in je partially in jest. Now, you and I have both had to suffer through the four e fourth edition is tabletop World of Warcraft. Ironic, it was all I World of Warcraft TRPG was using the third edition rules, but. We're not talking about that right now. That was all I ever heard of it, and the only and was the reason that I never actually got to play it when I was living in the region I was living in at that time. Well, if I'm going to endure that, then fifth edition is Overwatch. It's a hero arena shooter, and I'm and I'm pretty sure I'm. When it and when it comes to this comparison, there's one there's one thing I need to do first. Um, <clears throat> Paladins, eh? Paladins. I would bring up Gigantic, but Gigantic unfortunately is is not playable anymore, which is a very sad story because 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 of how dedicated people were to that. Um, but pa but Paladins and to and um. To a lesser extent, to a lesser extent, Rainbow Six Siege. Although, can you even call that a hero shooter? That one's that one's kind of debatable. But so I'll I'll skip that. But for, but a game like Paladins, um, I'm putting it I'm putting in a nice little bubble, and I'm putting it right over here, right in the corner. So what I say regarding this hero shooter analogy does not reflect on Paladins because you're in your bubble. And as an aside, Paladins may not be as polished as Overwatch, but I will always find it more interesting. And there's a reason why. Now, I will admit that that, that remark about, um, about, hero, about hero shooters I made in jest. However, a lot of truthful statements, especially here, especially here in the temple, are made in jest. Because, as a wise man once said, truth is the greatest comedy. The re the reason I'm the reason I say that kind of thing is with a lot of with a lot of hero shooters the whole the whole idea is a you ha you have a character with a defined kit a defined kit defined weapon abilities and an ultimate and you t and um usually having a usually having a set role which on paper is not a bad idea. The problem is when that set role is all that you're going to be doing. 
Um, Shammy TV had talked about this in his review of Overwatch and Paladins, and he had and the analogy that he uses that characters are meant to be played as, not with. Also saying I don't have a playstyle with uh, mo with with ki with characters. They have a playstyle. And where this ties into something like D and D is is a, is a very simple is is a very simple setup. If you have, what would be the what would be the points of difference if you have two characters who are who are let's say Ranger Gloomwalkers? The only real points of difference would be what bonus feats you pick. If, Otherwise, you're getting the same exact sets of, of features. If any, because I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, um, I know some people will bring up feats or bring up spells, spell choice when it comes to this kind of thing, but truth but truth be told, those are, those are bandages. Mm -hmm. And even when it comes to subclasses within a class, whether when I pick Fighter... Whether I'm picking a Psy Warrior, an Eldritch Knight, a bat a Battlemaster, or a Kensei, I still ha I still am I still am doing that within the framework of the fighter. And picking one of those doesn't change me doing fighter things. Now one would say that one would say that's a good thing, but the problem is it the problem is it only at it only adds more. It doesn't really change what I'm gonna be doing. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And cast and things like multi. I know some people will bring up multi-classing. That it, multi-classing is once again a fucking minefield. And it is astonishing to me that it is such a minefield when this was a problem that was fixed ten years ago. This was the reason why I wanted to do that thing with fourth edition because the approach that it had to multi-classing was using a feat system as we ta as we talked about when we did that special uh -huh. you pick one feat you grab a feat as your entry and you and you can use that to do power swaps just with just at a lower a lower level and you're not getting the normal benefit that you would from a sta from a standard feat you are it still takes dedication to do to do multi-classing but you don't have the you don't have the issue of um of of classes being treated as dips. Because you mean like people, third, third and third and to a certain to a certain extent fifth. It's harder to dip in fifth. I'll be honest. It is it is harder, but it's but it's but it's also hard it's also harder just to do just to do multi classing period because of the because of because of the roundabout way it's done. Oh. That and that in the time that they tried to do they tried to do ability score requirements for multi-classing which nobody used. Mm -hmm. But contra contrast that with two things. One, um the class design that we saw in fourth when we did that special where the best classes were ones that filled their roles, but you didn't have to always fill it the same way. Um, yeah. Case case in point, barbarians. And B, the the way class design is set up in Heavens and Heresies, because uh, through the combination of your of both your ancestry, your class, and your archetype. It is it is very you had you would have to actually try to have to have samey builds. If you're doing well, samey builds with um he, with heavens and heresies, you're doing it on purpose. Yeah, but uh, not to mention not like even ignoring ancestries and and uh, and backgrounds and all that, and looking at just class and archetype. Uh, you then have the di the differences between the classes who get their archetype a little later, and that the core class is is that basic uh, that basic uh, core set of features, and then each archetype is there to add uh, a, the final twist of the flavor you want to play that class fantasy as, mm -hmm. or if it's a class that gets their archetype immediately that determines 
what flavor your class is going to be in the first place. Um, even two people who are, say, blood barbarians, not going to be the same. They're going to use every. They're going to use their their class features differently, um, especially again going back outside of just the class. You then go into everything you get from your ancestries and your backgrounds and such, uh, and of course, there's going to be a different mindset behind using some of those features uh, for risk versus reward. Maybe you're being a tanky upfront barbarian who's there to soak damage, or maybe you're being a tanky up front barbarian who's there to do as much damage as possible who knows the way that you're going to play just that blood barbarian alone is going to be varied because it's got multiple pieces of utility mm -hmm. um personally i uh i absolutely i absolutely love it. it like i said it's a it's a design ethos that resonates with our own um and i know that i've made that point and you've made that point multiple times throughout this valley of the judged but uh this this is the right way to make it so that your choice in a class feels impactful and you're encouraged to play with the character mm -hmm. to experiment to, to change little details here here and there tweak and 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 twist until you have a character you like yeah now Someone, someone elsewhere had brought up had brought up um, why why I don't use fighting game fighting game characters in this comparison. The reason why I don't the reason why I don't think it would be a why I don't think it would be applicable is in the in the majority of in the majority of um, fighting games, even the simplest of them, you're going to be organically developing a playstyle with certain characters and. You're going to be picking certain characters because you prefer their particular kit. Yeah, most uh, fighting game characters' kits also uh, trend towards specific playstyle types as well. Mm -hmm. um, such as if we're using the Ur example of Street Fighter Two, um, the Shoto clones, Ryu, Ken, mm -hmm. um, they're their role back then was zone control. And you you could see that in the play style. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, there's a lot more... There's a lot more nuance and a lot more different roles that people can take, and just Ryu alone can take three different roles on his own because of the different options you can choose. Mm -hmm. Which, to be honest, is pretty awesome. Um, but the the skeleton of the structure was there yeah. and he, and um even if even it's easy it's easy to you it's easy to bring this kind of thing up with two with 2d fighters so so just just to make sure we cover all our bases let's consider a let's consider a 3d fighter like say um like say tekken i was tempted to use virtual fighter but virtual fighter has a very high has a very high floor it does virtual fighter is strange that way that's something we can consider in, on a on a geek watch at some point, I think. Yeah, I know. I know we've. I know we technically di did talk about did talk about fighting games early on when it came when it came to geek watch, but that was more a reflection of the community and how and how we and how we were in this sort we were in this sort of expl explosion of vi of varied tournament scenes cro um, cropping up in the in the wake of street. F in the wake of Street Fighter not performing as well as it had in the past. Yeah. But that's more uh that's that's more for Geek Watch more rails. Mm -hmm. Um but, but in even in some even in something like Tekken um you ha you st you still have you still have characters developing for cer for certain play for certain playstyles. It's just that it's it's on a different set of archetypes. You're not gonna. Ha it's more. 3D fighters are more about co are more about combinations, and pl and um, and three and 3D placement rather than territory control. Yeah, and uh, they're also they're also. I would say that a 3D fighter is a little more strategic, because of that additional third plane, of mo or the the second axis, mm -hmm. technically third axis of, of movement. Um. 
it makes predicting your opponent a little trickier. Yeah, there's. I'll um, I'll bring up. I'll bring up one. I'll, it's not. It's not in the form of Tekken, but I'll bring up one of my favorite pests <laughs> in the Dead or Alive series in the form of okay. Brad Wong. I thought. I thought you were gonna just bring up Eddie Guerrero and troll everybody. Um. Well, I, actually, tech. Actually, Eddie. Gu Eddie Gordo, although calling oh, yeah. him Eddie Guerrero is a glorious Freudian slip. It um, is. <laughs> they both they both they're both infamous for very similar reasons, that being very, very hard hard to predict where they're gonna hit because of because of the whole high, medium, and low thing that is very paramount with attack and defense in 3D fighters. Yep. Oh. Uh, and but the but the thing but the thing with the thing with them is is that you, is that it's very it's very difficult to cancel once you get caught in some in some of the more elaborate um animations. Mm -hmm. And this this all ties back into the fact that uh that that's a playstyle that appeals to a specific type of person uh, and a kit that will appeal to a specific type of playstyle. Um, compared to what we see with what's going on in things like heavens and heresies, um, I'd also made I'd also made a bit of in, made a bit of an in, in, made a bit of an aside that I it um it was kind of it was kind of amusing that some other five e ha some other five e hacks like Legend of the Metaverse and Twilight Dream, um, their solution was to was to make everybody casters on some level. Why does it sound like a glorious time of fuckery? Probably because it is. <laughs> although, although to be although to be fair, it's a natural choice for say a supers game. Well, yeah, everybody has to have powers of some sort, and, and powers usually manifest as some sort of caster type ability. And well, in Naruto Five E, which is actually really, really good. That's basically what they did. That's basically what they did because you kind of have to. <laughs> no, you don't, Rock Lee, motherfucker. Um, even tight, even tight jutsu count counts under the counts under the jutsu system for that game. Uh, that's that's lame. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I, I'll, I'll let it pass. But that's lame. But that was that was something I, that was something I wanted to clear up because this week we are covering um, artistries, which I would I would say I would say artistries fill, are filling the are filling the niche of um, of the proficiencies that were tip, that are non combat related and usually are usually are gained through backgrounds in Five E. Some of them are. Some of them do have some combat utility, from what I've been looking at. Yeah, but it, it def I, but that was definitely that was definitely a vibe that a vibe that I ended up getting. Since there's a whole lot of um a whole lot, in a, in a weird roundabout way, I'm kind of reminded of the rituals from Fourth Edition, which is wh um, which is where a lot which is where a lot of the more complicated spell um spells you had to spend money on went to back mm -hmm. then. And some of them do look like those, so maybe part of that was inspiration. Tanner can tell us when yeah. he's finished watching the episode. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I did. As is as is tradition, I did I did ask him his take on van on vanilla backgrounds and how he planned to address them with art with artistries. Um, he had he had said so. Artistries are an answer for a lot of things, so I'll address each of those. First, I wanted to create a system in the game which gave people things to spend money on. I wanted people to value the rewards they got from encounters and utilize it in a way that incorporated the game world. Artistries provide that since if you do not have proficiency in one, you can go to an NPC at twice the price and also reliant on whether or not the town you're in has such an NPC to provide you the service, of course, and have the artistry done for you. That means that even without proficiency, characters are given a way to interact in the game world with money. Now, a lot of TTRPGs give money as a reward with the goal that it should help characters interact with the game world, 
but very few TTRPGs really have a good system where money lets you interact unless you're reading off some page in the DMG, which, to be fair, is there and players' GMs should use it, and it's somewhat their fault if they don't. Like the, G like the DMG has how much it should cost for someone to cast a spell for you, I believe. Or it might be Xanathar's, but I believe it's the DMG, but most people ignore that. Whatever. Um... As far as as far as that whole thing, if it's buried in the D, if it's buried in the DMG with with very little incentive for play for players to utilize it, that's a failure. Um, mm -hmm. We'll we'll end up talking about this another day, but one one angle when it comes to why why there's the whole narrative of of um, D and D gets boring after tenth level. Some I'd say a, I'd say a good chunk of it has to do with the fact that so many adventures that are first party don't support it. That be now of course of course there are other factors which we'll get into when the time comes, but that's one that's one to consider. And also, um, I recent I I recently made fun of the of, of that of that new wave of errata that everybody's everybody's taking pot shots about. Since since um, WotC decided to come out and and say that and say please re please read the errata because that, because a lot of people's assessment is incorrect, which in my opinion is a failure to communicate. Um, but they they had argued they had argued that they want that they want people to to um to not to not feel they have to do the same evil for evil sake thing when it comes to the when it comes to monsters, which my response to that was. It's nice. It's nice to have that kind of vibe, but unless you're actually supporting it in the books, it may as well not exist. Uh huh. Don't hate the player. Hate the game. In this case, quite literally. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, getting back on it, he goes. Second, and this is what I mentioned. I've mentioned a lot. I wanted to make systems that let people interact with the game world, regardless of class. So, in that sense, artistries are my answer to the spell systems in most games. In fact, you'll see a lot of SRD D&D spells in the artistries by design. Every class can choose to gain access to an artistry if they want it, either at character creation or later through the use of feats and an artistry will always provide a window into some aspect of the game world that is useful depending on the artistry. Artistries are not limited by tier of play, only by tier of material. So if the players do something which grants them material above their tier, they're rewarded for that rather than you have to wait for reward silliness. Oh, hi, hi every um, ARPG I've played in the last 20 years. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry, you are, not no, you are not a high enough level to use this. I remember that. Or worse, you're, or worse, congratulations, here's your loot. About a third of it you can't use because you picked the wrong class. Yeah. Anyway, third, artistries allow people to flavor their characters in a way that doesn't need multi-classing, by which I mean taking levels in multiple classes. You don't need to take levels in wizard as a fighter to get weird magic stuff. You don't, or you don't need to take levels in ranger to get a pet. Animal handling is an artistry. Or you don't need to take levels in cleric to communicate with a powerful being. Divination artistry. You can be a necromancer or artificer with the evocation artistry, which is the hill I choose to die on, because originally evocation meant evo meant invoke spirits or souls, regardless of class. That is a fair point. When did e when did evocation turn into I blast shit? I don't know. Can't answer that question because I don't know. Yeah, I mean like. Because let, let's be honest, if somebody is an evoker, um, has a lot of evoker spells, they're a blaster. Yep, blaster caster. And well, we've we pretty much so, we pretty much filled that niche with the fact that the entire spell system in Heavens and Heresies is um, blasting. It can be. You can turn any spell into a blaster. Mm -hmm. Han would be right at home in this universe. <laughs> Just remember, folks, Han shot first. Yes. He goes. Also, a no also a note for the state of the artistry segment. Right now, there's a lot of superfluous stuff in there. One of the ways I design is by throwing a lot of crap on a pile and seeing which parts of it players gravitate towards. Then I streamline and develop those parts and delete the rest. 
We are still right in the thick of that process with artistries, so some of them, especially a lot of the rituals, will have a lot more streamlining placed on top of them. And a lot of that is already in the works with, for my handwritten notes, but that hasn't made it to the doc quite yet. Though I will be editing them. He said, though I will be editing them before you guys read them to make it easier on y'all. They're just super tedious and fiddly to edit. Oh. Um, we appreciate your efforts, Tanner. I mean, obviously we appreciate your efforts a lot since we're putting all of Heavens and Heresies that currently exist through, <laughs> through the Valley of the Judged. And it's been getting rave reviews, but uh, we uh, we we do sincerely appreciate the effort you put forth mm -hmm. for all of this. Yeah. Now, for with that with that said, the thing I think it's I think it's high time we delved into we delved into artistry, artistry's proper, and this means it's the return of it's the return of the many accents of Xanatrix Zadare. That and the fact that uh we get a twofer today because uh, Tanner did in fact add a a, a, a beginning to the spells. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately, there's no melody, so I'm going with Pop Goes the Weasel. Uh. <clears throat> Which means I'm actually going to f begin with this is a children's song based on a legendary Haru E sorcerer. Skitter and scuttle, all things become rubble. Truly the Rat King lives with blight and with ire. I'll fear his fire. Truly the Rat King lives. His treasure, his hoard, befit for a lord. Truly the Rat King lives, never to die. And life is a lie. Truly the Rat King lives. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I'm here for the rest of forever. Um, but now, accent time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if your aim is to survive, understanding your artistries is of utmost importance. There are many of them, yes. But I guarantee you, your enemies will know their artistries. If your wounds act instead like curses, it is important to be able to recognize that an aspect of the plague ritual has been put upon the land. And even more important, it is vital that you know how to remove such plagues. If your aim is to avoid detection, you should know the proper anti-divination rituals. If you step on hallowed ground, you should know the manner in which it was hallowed. Artistries are the great equalizer between marked and unmarked souls. One does not need to be graced by the powers of a class to use artistries. No, one only needs training, preparation, and the correct materials in order for an artistry to function. You will see many artistries throughout your travels. Let not ignorance lead to your death. Corwin of Dusk, Paladin of the First Order, Righteous Potentate of Theos. Wait, First Order? Nah, too easy. <laughs> Traitor! <laughs> Sad face. Oh uh, yeah, the 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 most the most ridiculous looking tonfa I've ever, I've ever seen. It's almost as ridiculous looking as the uh, five bladed uh, beam katana that uh, that Travis touchdown gets. Almost, except one of them has the advantage of being Travis touchdown. Moe. <laughs> so he put a. <clears throat> Before we even get to the opening part, he get, he put a big important dev note. Most of the artistries should be viewed as viewing blocks which demonstrate goals rather than completed mechanics. All of the artistries here have at least enough to make them workable, but I will eventually add more and fill out more options for each. A lot of this is derived from feedback I receive on the various things people want to see in their fantasy game. I take some of those suggestions to heart. Oh, sorry, the sum the sum is isn't what is on my and sorry I don't know why I thought that I take those suggestions to heart and work on incorporating them into the game that said I know some of the artistries need more stuff but for the purposes of having building blocks from which to work all the artistries have just enough to give people an idea of how they work also a lot of the rituals repeat too often I will streamline them eventually but it is a lot of work to do so when looking through a lot of the rituals, treat them more like concepts rather than hardened mechanics. Pretty much all of the mechanics will have some will have more clarification later, but right now they are the building blocks. I have another playtest campaign coming up, which should get me all the rituals streamlined. As a, also as a small aside, a few 
features mention skill attack bonus. It's buried in the introduction, but that is proficiency plus class ability modifier. And an asterisk. As a general rule, adventurers are able to pay someone to perform one of, th one of the artistries for them at double the cost. The exception to this is animal handling. Animals only cost one times materials because animal handling actually affects a role, whereas the other art artistry proficiencies don't. So the first one we have is alchemy. To get to gain something, something of equal value must be... Well, sorry, wrong script. Uh, <laughs> I knew you were going to go ahead and do that. <laughs> but considering we just got the animal handling artistry mentioned as well, I'm surprised you didn't choose, in, in say, uh, choose inst instead to say, uh, shall we play Big Brother Edward? That is too easy. That too is easy, why. but also much more traumatizing. And you know how I like to traumatize the entire audience. You're not wrong, and I hate it. <laughs> anyway, for some, the base potions offered to common adventurers are not enough. They want to modify their potions. You can't see it, but I'm raising my hand. Those with I proficiency mean... in alchemy are able to do so. Even for the best trained alchemists, alchemical effects are not stable and alchemical ef effects like food spoil. Um, alchemical effects are not stable and alchemical effects like food spoil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some, something about the wording of that doesn't feel right to me. I don't know what. Uh, the repeating. Yeah. Effects fade if they are not used within a short duration and cannot be stored for any na uh, for any for any real length of time. Ah. For this reason, many adventurers must choose to learn alchemy for themselves, to more readily have access to advanced potions and poisons when they need it most. So first we have poisons. And if you listen close, you can because I brought up poison, you can hear you Do I you know, do I sing it again, monk? No. No, I'm, kill I'm <laughs> killing it off right there. Uh, <laughs> these are either ingested or applied to weapons as a 20-foot quick action. Poisons may also be thrown at an enemy. The range for thrown poisons is 10 feet, 15 feet. Throwing a poison is treated like a thrown weapon attack, but you may not add your proficiency modifier to the attack roll unless you have proficiency in alchemy. The poison has the secondary option, which makes it an area attack. Features which modify attacks only apply to one target at the center of the a at the AOE, rather than all targets unless explicitly stated. So it looks. Now we're familiar with second with secondary effects after de after dealing with this with um with ma with magic, uh -huh. but in this case, the the um rarity or rather the currency cost of the p of the poison determines the number of secondary effects it can have common zero uncommon one rare three very rare five and legendary eight a legendary potion with eight secondary effects mm -hmm. and how uh, <laughs> I, I i want to i want to know just how screwed could a legendary poison make somebody um Remember what happened with the Hydra poison? Heh. <laughs> yes. So we in Hydra. So let's see. We have we have elemental poison, which does one afflicted of a, of an associated damage type. Constitution defense, the required the required resonance varies on the element, clearly. Mm -hmm. yep. Um psychic a, you have a psychic poison, which does one afflicted um, psychic, has wits as the defense, and requires a psychic resonance. You have the compelling concoction, so love potion, which does one severity of compel against resolve defense, and requires a psychic enthrall resonance. A and so... Go ahead. The, just a bit of a clarification there. Remember that resonances have a primary and a secondary. Mm -hmm. um, the primary resonance here is psychic. The secondary is basically a sub, a uh, sub 
a sub resonance within that resonance, a subcategory, mm -hmm. and that's enthrall. Yep. Let's see, a maddening concoction in inflicts one severity of confusion again um, against intuition defense, and requires psychic and madness for its primary and secondary resonances. So for somatic, we have hemorrhaging poison, which inflicts two afflicted physical versus constitution requires a somatic resonance vulnerability poison does one does one vulnerable versus dexterity and weakening poison does one weakened versus strength so uh would would the hemorrhaging poison just be the ebola virus you know my radio station did a song called e ebola polka back in the 90s <laughs> And I still have that song. Nice. Oh. Then again, these are the same people who also did Carp Killer. Well, what did the carp ever do to you? <laughs> and for those who for those who for those who don't know, it was KQRS. <laughs> you know you know how notorious they can get. <laughs> Indeed. Anyway, let's see some um, somatic, like we said, hem um, hemorrhaging, vulnerability, and weakening poison. Oh, light, light and dark, light and dark. You have a blinding poison, so one blind hidden. Um, versus wits requires a darkness resonance or marking poison, which inflicts one mark. Versus intuition with a light slash dark um, resonance. Then we have Rift, where you can e either a Crippling Poison, which inflicts one Hindered, versus Dexterity, or a Stunning Poison, which inflicts one Stunned, versus Strength. Both of them require a Rift Resonance. And there are two secondary effect options that we have here. One is, add another instance of the primary effect. The other is, at, at, the, co at the cost of one second SE slot, it now ex it now explodes into a five foot sphere, and for and two and for two more, you can increase you can increase the range. Um, with with a asterisk of if you put if you make it into a sphere, it cannot be applied to weapons or ingested. Um, so that would mean a a legendary, let's let's say a let's say a legendary um compelling potion concoction could if you if you just dumped all of it into the into the primary effect instance could do um a total of nine compel that's um that's a lot because if the if the uh if the creature chooses to try and resist the co the the compel uh you know the the compulsion itself. Uh, they take that psychic damage. That's ninety six psychic damage. Yeah, and uh, at a as we've pointed out about HP before, HP totals do not get super high. Um, if that damage somehow you you roll maximized somehow, that's a uh, that's fifty four damage. That's enough to kill a lot of things. Just. I decided to, I decided to roll ninety six on my die roller. That's the roll the result I got thirty three. That's about median, so yeah. But if someone's really unlucky, if they end up getting a bunch of box cars, that's enough to get them either close or, or um, probably or probably get or probably get them KO'd. Did we? I don't know if we ever. So, I don't remember seeing that in the equipment section, and maybe I'm just over overthinking it. And we did go over it, but if poison is applied to a weapon, um, how long does it last when applied to the weapon? I know that when a potions last for one minute or for the duration of the threatening encounter, whichever is longer. What about poisons? Is it the same? I don't, I, don't, I, do, I don't remember seeing that anywhere, so... Let me, um... 
Let me check. Let me go into items and equipment and check. If not, this is a first point of clarification. Also, um, Monk, I do have to note that we were, when it came to the secondary effects we were reading in spells, mm -hmm. um, Tanner did correct us, and there's a dev note here that corrects again. When it says two plus, that doesn't mean two more points. That means if you choose the same effect again, you get additional. Uh, the dev oh. note further down in Potion says, this means that the first time you choose the effect, it gives you three, but only one additional each time you choose the secondary again. All right, my bad on that front. It's, our, it's it's our bad in general for assuming things. I'd say that makes it a bit more efficient because otherwise I'd I'd have the assumption that you need to spend, um, you need to spend two two slots each in order to increase the AOE. Yeah, this just means that if you choose AOE twice, you go one and then two. It's a ten foot sphere. If you choose it three times, it's a fifteen foot sphere, etc. Yeah. But I ch I checked equipment. I didn't unless I missed it. I didn't see anything about how about how long a po a poison applied to a weapon would last. Yeah. So I I think I think that is going to be a necessary clarification. Is it until you hit something and then the poison is gone, or is it on your weapon for the entire encounter? Mm -hmm. So. Next is potions, with a dev note. Explanations are quick and dirty for now, I know. So, po potions must be ingested or applied to an unconscious ally as a 20-foot quick action. They require their associated material resonance to make, and they last for one minute or for the duration of a threatening encounter, whichever is longer. Um. Although, it let me ch I'm guessing that I'm guessing that um po that potions also have the relationship between currency cost and number of secondary effects because that's not I that's the case but that would also be another thing to clarify mm -hmm. so and I'd I'd say I'd say another thing to clarify in the in these is what resonance is required well um when it comes to invigorate and uh i mean we can infer and, it but it's not there yeah invigorate and fortify are um under elemental so they require some sort of elemental uh resonance mm -hmm. likely it's o it only means the primary resonance then yeah um so with f fortifying potion grants one fortify invigorating potion grants one invigorate um, that and that's our elemental potions. For psychic, yep. we have resolute and bolstering, which grant one resolute and one bolstering. Yeah. Um, for somatic, we have a soothing potion, which grant, which at the first, the first one grants three soothed, and then, and then two, and then um, everyone after that, um, an additional soothed with a dev note saying, this means the first time you choose the effect, it grants, it gives you three soothed. But only one additional soothe each additional time you choose the soothing potion secondary. Oh. Yeah, he's, it's talking about the secondary effect that adds another instance of the potion's primary effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am wonder. I am wondering if if potions and poisons are going to get their are going to get exclusive secondary effect options like spells do. If that's something that's planned. Um, anyway, the light and the light and dark end of things, we have the potion of lucidity, which grants one lucid, and this is definitely one case where what its resonance should be should probably be clarified. And finally, the quickening potion, which grants one quickened. And the secondary effect options are f more s are a mirror are a mirror of the poison ones to the point where they're to the point where there's a bit of copy pasta going on. Well, um, 
Yeah. <laughs> In fact, that last line probably shouldn't even be there. You wouldn't apply a potion to a to a weapon. Mm-hmm. I'm not even sure you'd throw a potion for a five foot sphere, because it says at the top you you either ingest it or apply it to an unconscious ally or ally. Excuse me. Um, I, I'm not sure that line should be there at all, or even those effects. Uh, I'll leave that to Tanner to correct. <laughs> I mean, if you want to do a healing bomb, I'm sure you. I'm, um, or a buffing bomb, I'm sure you could. Um, That's going to be weird. <laughs> but uh, I actually don't think that the resonance issue is as big as you might think here, Monk. Uh, Light-dark is the same resonance, remember. Light-dark is... The, you, if you get a material that is light, it is going to be a material that is light-dark, because it's one spell that's there. Mm-hmm. And thus one resonance. Yeah, it's, um, it's not a major thing, but it's some, it's something to keep in mind. Yeah. All of these, by the way, are all beneficial conditions, and thus, as per the notes on every beneficial condition back in Chapter 1, uh, this condition is considered a beneficial condition and is limited by the character's either focus or fortitude. Mm-hmm. Um... Which, as an aside, focus and fortitude, I, st- I still maintain is a nice way to keep people from buff stacking. Yeah, it's really nice. Mm-hmm. So, next we get animal handling. And this is really in... Wow, that's a... This is huge. So... This is gigantic. <laughs> Super quick summary here in the dev note. I'll fill it out later. This should be enough to get a usable pet with some imagination, but also give you a good idea where this artistry is going. There was a lot to tackle with this artistry. Pets needed to feel like individual creatures, but also needed to mesh well with player agency. I believe I have the best of both worlds here with the compulsions. As of writing this, the, si- the system has seen some actual play tests and has performed much better than I expected for the initial test. Animal companions serve a variety of purposes. Beasts of burden, scouts, trackers, war steeds... Nuisances. Sorry, did I say that out loud? No, no, not at all. I didn't hear you say nuisances at all. <laughs> to and to charge through the lines of battle, and Mirari is home to a great plethora of beasts for these purposes. Animal handling allows a character to interact with such beasts and gain the benefits of your aid. Zan, why why are you thinking of Monster Hunter? Um, I, I'm, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. It's not, it's not like I ride a pony-sized dog to go kill a dragon-sized wolf. Or, or anything like that. I wasn't even going to bring that up. I was going to bring up the palicos. My palicos. I love them so much. Finding the perfect palicos is hard, monk. It's hard, I tell you. You have to you have to scrub the village constantly looking for the perfect fucking gathering palico. I'm I'm babbling. Rails. Mm-hmm. The palicos are awesome as well, yes. Yep. So so un- it says, unlike other artists, unlike other artistries, any character may purchase an animal companion, but only those with proficiency in the artistry may add their class ability modifier and proficiency bonus to the roll of the d20 in order to overcome an animal companion's compulsion. Without proficiency in the artistry, this the roll is made without any modifiers. Controlling animal companions, like any other character, animal companions take their own turn in in, in the initiative order. If initiative is being tracked, but but are controlled by the player which purchased the companion, in the case where the party purchases an animal companion, like a pack mule to carry the party's belongings, the group may designate someone to control the animal in an encounter. Unlike player characters, animal companions, being animals, have traits and compulsions which sometimes make them act outside the party's control. For example, the non-war beast animal companions automatically come with the skittish trait. Which makes them, which causes them to flee from threatening situations. In order to control their com- their companion, a player must roll against the companion's handling DC detailed below, using either their reaction or a 15-foot quick action on their turn. On a success, 
The player is able to control the animal, but on a failure, the animal will act on its compulsion on its next turn. That That's ingenious. And I can see how that's going to slot into both the druid and ranger uh, um, archetypes that he hadn't yet filled out regarding animal companions. Mm-hmm. This is this is going to be giving them their own natures by which they react to situations is absolutely a, a great way of making them feel alive. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. Let's see. Let's see. Then we get to animal companions and death. If an animal is reduced to zero hit points, it falls unconscious and, like any other character, makes a mark against its vitality whenever it takes damage or at the end of its turn. Unlike a player character, however, if an animal companion takes damage at zero hit points or ends its turn with zero hit hit points and has no remaining vitality, it dies. Alternate method. For those who are against having their pets die, sometimes dead is better. (laughs) You're going to hell for that one, Monk. Yes, I am. You'll be in good company, though. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. The very very least least I I can go up to the devil and ask for my money. Yeah. Well, not ask. More of, bitch, where's my money? Kick him in the teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, the animal companion can be considered to be injured and will be unable to act in any meaningful way until it receives healing in a settlement. The party must spend a material equal to the animal's tier in order to heal it. So, um, if you use this setting and you're and, and you're and you have a pet griffin or something like that, well, good luck trying to get that. Good luck trying to get anybody to heal it. Eh, I mean, if you have a griffin, you likely have materials equivalent to griffins. Then again, so. then, then again, um, since since material tiers are not tied to level, there is the possibility of getting so, of getting something outside your tier. This is also true. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd also like to note, though, monk, griffins are pretty powerful as far as a, a physical combat being goes. I don't see one going down easy. No, but you you know that you know that if certain writers were doing it, they'd they'd um job out the griffin to make the to make the enemy seem more threatening, the same way oh. Smurfs get jobbed out or the way um custodies get jobbed out, even though they're supposed to be the elite of the elite. So what we're talking about once again is a trope commonly known as the wharf effect. Yeah. Anyway, then we have. Next, we have the components of animal companions. Animal companions have a different have a number of different components. Their size, tiny, small, medium, or large, which grant them their base traits, including defenses, proficiency, and base carry capacity. Their purpose, war beast, scout, or pack mule, which determines. Um, hang on. You put in which determines twice. <laughs> which determines which determines. Which determines which determines. The tasks they are able to adequately perform and their personality traits which determine their tendencies and compulsions. Animal companions are represented by the following stat block. And we have a sample companion. Which has tier, proficiency, size, hit points, movement, ability defenses, bonus features, personality traits and compulsions, and six vitality. Oh, they could be I don't know if six vitality is going to be the limit. Mm-hmm. Again, it's probably going to be determined by their size and what they are and their purpose, like it mentions. Mm-hmm. And with an asterisk of, like other non-player creatures in the game, <clears throat> animal companions do not have ability scores, only a proficiency bonus, which is applied to all things in which it, in which it is proficiency. Proficient. And defenses. Animal companions are considered to have a fortitude and focus with a maximum of five for focus equal to their proficiency modifier. So let's see. So let's see. At t- so we have five tiers, as usual. 
And mm -hmm. base hit points range from 10 all the way up to 40. With a vitality of 2 to 6. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it depends on their material and their size and such, probably. Um, base proficiency ranges from 3 to 7. Movement is always 30 is always thirty feet, though there's an asterisk I'll get into a minute. They use D4s for base attack damage, but it, and, which goes from 1 to 5 D4, and can have 1 to 5 bonus features and a skill DC of 10 all the way to 25. With a very strange uh, layering here of 10 at, at common, 15 at uncommon, 18 at rare, 20 at very rare, and then 25 at legendary. Mm-hmm. Interesting layering. Yeah. See, in addition to this movement, an animal companion has a vertical jump of 5 feet, a horizontal jump of 10 feet, and one of the following options. A swim speed of 20 feet, a swim speed of 10 feet, and a climb speed of 5 feet, or a climb speed of 15 feet. They also have the following base defenses. A GM determines the placement of these defenses, but if a player is looking for a specific animal with specific defenses, or if that animal is important to the character's identity, the GM may let the player pick the placement of the creature's defenses. Physical, So 10, 12, and 14 for the physical defense array, and 8, 10, and 12 for the mental defense array. And those will just get plotted amongst those defenses, either by the GM or in really important situations by the player. Mm -hmm. In addition, animal companions grant certain bonuses depending on their, si depending on their size, as shown on the tables below. So, Tiny gets access to proficiency and features, a plus two to dexterity defense, and a base carry of two. Small gets at, gets bonuses to proficiency and damage reduction, gets a, gets a plus one to dexterity and constitution defense, and has a base carry capacity of three. Medium companions ha gets bonus to hit points and proficiency, and has a plus one... Bo defense bonus to strength and constitution and has a carrying capacity of 4. Large gets bonus to hit points and damage reduction and gets a def gets a plus 2 strength defense bonus and has a base carry capacity of 5. And there's an asterisk. Tiny creatures get an additional feature rather than an increase to damage reduction or hit points. And once again we have that thing where he... Um, he he intends on making it so that he, so that each size gets something different. We kind of saw something like this when it came to the armor types. Mm -hmm. And it's double stacked with uh, the tier as well, just like it was with the armor types as well. Mm -hmm. um, each tier, the bonus hit points is 5 through 25 based on tier. The bonus proficiency is 1 through 3, with 1, 1, 2, 2, 3 being the spread. And the bonus damage reduction is two through four, with two, three, three, four, four as the spread there. So, if you have a large tier five monster as your as your uh, animal companion, they're going to get twenty five extra hit points and four extra damage reduction, yeah. plus two strength, and have a base carry capacity of five. As as a minor thing, I am a bit curious what's going to constitute a companion for each size. I mean, I have I have my guess I have my guesses. Mm-hmm. Oh. At the vi at the very least, al although you want to know you want to know what I you want to know what I realized, um, through this com through the animal handling artistry, you could turn you would probably turn your inquisitor into Shadow from FF six. Plead the fifth. <laughs> See, Interceptor, go! <laughs> then we have companion features and training. Companions are granted a number of features based on their tier. All animal companions start with one of the base features, which designates the type of training they have received. In general, animal companions are able to fulfill the tasks for which they have received training without requiring any external action from the PCs. If an animal companion is ordered to fulfill a tra task which it has no training, for example, if a player commands their war beast to retrieve an item from a hard-to-reach location, an animal must be able the animal must be able to see and hear the player, and the player must use their action and make a roll against the animal companion's DC, adding in their proficiency and class ability modifier if they have proficiency in animal handling. 
On a success, the animal will listen to the player. On a failure, the animal will be unable to understand the instructions being given to it. Animal companions may only follow one set of instructions at a time, and players may only give them give give them commands outside of their training for tasks they could they could complete in a single turn, and may not give them complex commands which are outside of their specific training. A war beast, for example, could be commanded to retrieve an item from a hard to reach location, so long as it could reach that location and run back in a single turn. A war beast could not be commanded to scout an entire area on its own, as it would not be able to complete the task in a single turn, nor could it be tasked with picking a specific item from a large group, since that would require specialized scout training. Dev note. For now, because I am a single because I am a single human, I'm using the common sense fiat for these benefits and trainings. I'll give them more specific language later, but for now, oh, war beasts can act normally in threatening encounters. Pack mules slash mounts can carry stuff normally, and scouts can gain information about stuff, get objects, track tr track creatures, and all that jazz. All animal companions must have one of the following base features, depending on what what it is. So war beasts, I think we. We we already we already kind of covered that. So it can act as an oral participant in threatening encounters. It may add its proficiency modifier in onto its damage rolls from attacks it makes. Pack mules slash mounts. The creature's carrying capacity is doubled. If it receives a bonus to carrying capacity later, later that bonus is not doubled. It is able to move normally without being hindered while it is carrying objects and other creatures. And scouts have more text. So, the creature is able to scout an area, giving the player information about the layout of the land and the density of any creatures in the area. It cannot distinguish between creatures of the same type, but can distinguish between different types of creatures. For example, one might send their falcon to scout ahead and look for a Silwari raider ambush. The falcon could distinguish between Silwari raiders and wolves, but not between individual Silwari, and thus could not be sent to look for a specific Silwari raider. Does that mean does that mean that we can't have animal companions helping out bounty hunter type characters? Yep, no eagle vision. We're not the assassins of Assassin's Creed. Mm -hmm. uh, the creature is able to perform simple tasks of location and retrieval. The creature is able to distinguish between cer between certain types of objects, such as the difference between keys and coins, but not between similar objects of the same type. For example, the creature could be instructed to steal a key ring off a guard, but could not be instructed to steal a specific key from the ring. I'd say I'd say that's fit. I'd say that's fitting the archetype. Mm -hmm. Then we have additional companion fe companion features, which there's a f which, and you choose a, you choose a number of additional features for the companion based on the tier. A GM may limit the available features depending on the area or what the available animal trainers have to offer, though in larger cities, animals of all types should be available. Some features have prerequisite features that must be met in order for them to be chosen. Features may not be chosen multiple times unless explicitly stated. So we have increased carrying capacity, gives two more carrying capacity, can be taken up to twice. Charger, war beasts and mounts only. In order to utilize the feature, the animal companion must act before its rider. If the animal companion moves at least 20 feet in a straight line toward a creature on its turn, the next attack against that creature but taken by its rider has a plus 2 threat range. See, flight. The animal companion gains a 20-foot fly speed. This can be taken twice, granting an additional 10 feet the second time. Swimmer. Must that they... Of course, they must have a swim speed. Increases that by 15 feet and can be taken twice. Climber. Of course, they must have a climb speed. Increases their climb speed by 15 feet. And this can be taken up to twice. Athletic. Increases their movement speed by 15 feet. Its vertical jump by 5 feet and its horizontal jump by 10. Or hardy. Increases their vitality by 2. Uh, and distinguishing the last one. 
which need it, which is a scout only thing. The animal companion is able to distinguish between creatures and objects of the same type. Thus, in the previous example, it could distinguish between different Silwari raiders and different keys on a ring. Well, looks like I answered my own question. You can have the bounty hunter archetype with your animal companion. Indeed. You know, just send out just send out your falcon and 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 get, show them the wanted poster and say whichever one this is, um, bird drop on them. <laughs> uh, and a dev note there will be more features here later I'm waiting to see what the playtesters want to be in here and then making them according to that so then we have companion personality traits and compulsions dev note base down and dirt and dirty brass tacks description incoming <laughs> um so Every, an every animal companion has a compulsion and an unfavorable trait. Whenever a compulsion is triggered, the pet on its next turn will follow the requirements of that compulsion unless its owner makes a, su a successful roll against the animal's DC. A character may use their reaction or a 15-foot quick action on their turn to attempt the roll. On a success, the animal doesn't follow its compulsion. On a failure, it does. Many compulsions present two different options. In the case where there are multiple options for a compulsion, or if multiple compulsions are triggered at once, the GM chooses the most disruptive option. This is in bold. Dev note, the, DM, the GM must choose the most disruptive option as per the rules. This is for a number of reasons. First, it ensures that when something goes wrong with a companion, something actually goes wrong, which has a palpable effect on the game world, Second, it ensures that the GM is never accused of being a dick or favoritism because they don't have a choice in which side of the compulsion they pick. They have to choose the most disruptive action. Let's no, this just... I was, I was going to say, this just means that all players are just going to say that the GM is a dick. <laughs> if they have to pick the, the most disruptive option, even if that's rules is written, um, all players are going to be like, that's just the GM being a dick. Well, let's be fair, the GM is going to be accused of being a dick no matter what. Exactly. Oh. So then we have a short list of compan of compulsions. And he does note that there will eventually be more compulsions to give more variety, but here's a base rough draft. So we have aggressive, when the animal companion deals or takes damage is the trigger. The animal companion must attack you, the creature it damaged, or the creature that damaged it. If the creature is not in range, the animal companion uses its movement, all of it if it has to, in order to attack the creature. An animal companion may only have this feature if it has the war beast feature. No, that says war best, not war, war beast. Yeah. War, now it says war beast. Mm -hmm. um, also, the, also, uh, also, this isn't the feature. This is a um. Com this is a um, compulsion. Why is it being why is it being written as a feature? No, the an animal. Can, yeah, well, yeah. And like, it's the only one that says feature too instead of compulsion. It's mm -hmm. it's an artifact. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. Next, we have protection. Or sorry, protective. Triggered when an animal companion's owner takes damage. The animal companion must either attack the creature that harmed its owner, using all of its movement if necessary to get to the creature. If the party purchased the animal companion, it chooses a an. Is that supposed? Is this supposed to be a party member or at? No, this is supposed to be a. So I'm getting rid of that n. Mm -hmm. Party member th to be protective of for each encounter or rush to the side of its owner. It may make one attack against the creature near it before doing so. An animal companion may only have this compulsion if it has the war beast feature. Well, there you go. There's that interceptor. Because remember, his whole thing in battle was he'd come out and attack things sometimes when Shadow would get attacked. Mm -hmm. um, I, I could have gone with Angelo, but there's a whole lot more things that Angelo can do. Angelo has too many moving parts. Mm -hmm. And Angelo also isn't really a companion. He's a limit break. Among other things. <laughs> Angelo Cannon. <laughs> um, skid, skittish. Any th um, triggered by any threatening encounter. 
The animal companion must make a DC 15 check, adding its proficiency modifier to the roll, or use all of its movement to flee the encounter. An animal companion may only have this compulsion if it does not have the war beast feature. If it gains the war beast feature later, it loses this compulsion and gains a new one instead. Um, fearful, triggered when the animal companion takes damage. The animal companion uses its movement to flee in a direction it feels safest. An animal companion may only have this compulsion if it does not have the war beast feature. If it gains the war beast feature later, it loses this compulsion and gains a new one instead. And lastly is proud, triggered when the animal companion is below half health in an encounter or is in serious danger outside of an encounter. The animal companion is unable to retreat if it was pursuing a goal like scouting or attacking a creature. It is compelled to continue that goal despite the threat to its life. If it is currently retreating, it stops and faces its current threat. Um, I just re I just realized with the comp with the way the um, way the animal companion is designed here, um, you could possibly create Battle Hopper with this. <laughs> you could. Thank you, Monk. That was an image <laughs> I didn't need right now. <laughs> Just remember, it's Golgum's fault. True. Or if, or if you, I wanted, to, I was gonna go with either that or the, or the Deuce from Brutal Legend. <laughs> you could create the Deuce using this system. Or even worse. Can't. Oh no. Oh no! <laughs> this is not Knight Rider. We do not have David. You do not hassle the Hoff. <laughs> so unfavorable traits. All animal companions also have an unfavorable trait chosen by the GM. Unlike compulsions, unfavorable traits are passive traits, which are applied to the animal companion. And like above, there will be more traits to provide variety. But he says, "But I am quite tired." <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna add that while choosing the the most disruptive outcome between compulsions is rules as written. This says this this does not say anything about what you have to choose as as the GM for these unfavorable traits. So this is where you're gonna get the biggest cries of that's a dick move, GM. Mm -hmm. So we have overeater. The animal companion must eat an additional ra ration one encumbrance each day in order to survive. Heavy-footed, their movement is reduced by five feet. Loud, working title, the animal companion has disadvantage on any ability skullduggery checks made in order to avoid detection. Willful, the animal companion's challenge DC decreases by three. Increases. Increases. Physically weak, one of the animal's physical defenses is, re is reduced by two. And mentally weak, one of the animal's mental... Mentally defenses. Is reduced by two. Um, not only do I like how animal... Com how uh, So far we're two for two when it comes to good um, artistries. Mm -hmm. I do like that, unli unlike, in, unlike in the past, anim um, Animal Companion is not a class feature. Which means... With, which of course means that there's room for, there's room to have that handled in other places. Also, you can also it um. It was always kind of silly to me that the that that um the classes that that the classes that were expected to have an animal companion back in say, third edition were the ranger, the druid, and the paladin. Mm-hmm. I mean, to be fair, those are three classes that would have it, but um. um the paladin got a war steed. Yeah, but what's sto what's what's stopping what's stopping a what's stopping a wizard from ha from having it from having their own horse? No, you you broke the joke, monk. What's stop what's stopping the sorcerer from having his own horse, horserer? <laughs> Fair point. Anyway, next we get to culinary arts, also known as the Gordon Ramsay artistry. The artistry both Monk and I love. Mm -hmm. 
Um, proficiency in the culinary arts all, all allows an adventurer to take the resonances harvested from encounters and utilize them into a hearty meal for their companions. Um, great. Now I'm think now I'm thinking of the palico meal from Monster Hunter World. Well, monk, this is um making mystery meat croquettes uh, a la kill a kill. <laughs> yeah, and we probably dated ourselves bringing up mystery meat, but it is what it is. <laughs> to this day, no one knows what's in that shit. It's worse than spam, which is saying something. Spam! Spam! Bacon and spam! So, for... Any character can cook a meal. If they do, it's fucking raw! But one with proficiency <laughs> in the culinary arts can infuse that meal with resonance, making it grant special benefits to their party. How many how many RP how many RP how many RPGs in video game form have we played that has that has an entire subsystem around cooking? Um I I don't want to start counting, Monk. We'll be here all night. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we can count that high. Especially if we bring up the Atelier games. Which in that case the answer is yes. Both for Atelier and for and for Tales and for Star Ocean. You, you can't see it, but I have a thousand yard sta stare like a Vietnam vet right now. <laughs> so first we get to cooking a meal. A meal must be cooked during a period of downtime. Obviously, you can't be a combat. You can't be that kind of combat chef. Typically, we can't be Queen of Quen. What is this? I demand Queen of Quen. <laughs> <laughs> oh. In the typically in the downtime just bef just before or after a rest, if a meal is made after a rest, the effects of it last until the adventurer's next rest, or the next time, w or the next or the next time would one would have an up. Hold on. Yeah, would have the opportunity to rest. Staying up all night does not preserve the effects of a meal. Good call there. If a meal is cooked just before a rest, the effects last until the adventurer's next rest after that one. Again, staying up all night the following night does not preserve the effects of a meal. The most basic meal requires one material's worth of ingredients, and up to four people may receive the bonus may receive the bonuses from this meal. In order to cook for multiple people, an adventurer may double the recipe and complete it in the same period in which they would put in which they push forward. They must provide all necessary ingredients for two separate recipes, but may feed up to eight people. An adventurer can only benefit from the effects of one meal at a time. At their most basic level, meals prepared by an adventurer provide temporary vitality, and one need not have proficiency in culinary arts in order to cook them. As described above, these temporary vitality and any other effects of the meal disappear at the end of the adventurer's next rest, or the rest after that after that if they eat a meal and then immediately rest after. Temporary vitality can exceed the adventurer's maximum vitality just as temporary hit points are gained on top of regular hit points. So the and then we have the the fact that the the um, quality of ingredients determines bonus vitality, so common one, uncommon two Rare three, very rare four, legendary five, with a dev note of, this is hu this is huge. So many characters utilize vitality for their cla for the class mechanics, meaning that eating regular meals are going to make them far more effective. A barbarian is best with a full stomach. This means that having a cook is a is almost a must. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously not actually a must, but still. A good idea. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have cooking a complex meal. Complex cooking is the heart and soul of the culinary arts, combining complex ingredients into master masterfully constructed recipes, which offer various abilities f from the creatures used to create them. At their core, mm -hmm. the culinary arts function just like and just like many other features in Heavens and Heresies. Spending materials will allow a character to choose from among the secondary effects affiliated with the material's resonance. Only a character proficient in culinary arts is able to infuse their meals with these secondary effects. The material's quality used 
used in the meal determines how many secondary effects may be chosen from that resonance's list of secondary effects. You may choose the number of secondary effects as shown in the table below. So for common and uncommon, one option. For rare and very rare, two options. And for legendary, three options. The material's resonance determines which secondary effects may be chosen. You may choose the same secondary effect multiple times, stacking their effects. When consumed, the meal grants a character both the temporary vitality of the normal meal and the chosen secondary effects, which last for the same duration of the effects of the normal meal. Oh, Jesus. So, let's see. Let, so, we have... It looks like we've got four effects, four, four secondary effects for each um, resonance. So, for, for Psychic, max willpower goes up by one, or... Or l lowest mental defense goes up by one, or focus goes up by one, uh, or plus one to persuasion checks. Um, elemental is the only one that doesn't have three effects. You can either A, gain resistance to the damage type associated with the secondary resonance of the meal ingredient, B, increase your lowest physical defense by one, or C, Plus one to ability checks made to traverse, understand, or otherwise interact with nature or natural terrain. Nice. Oh. Light, light and dark can either A. Ignore one severity of the hidden condition on creatures and objects around you. B. Plus one to investigation checks. C. When you are not threatened, you may benefit from one severity of the hidden condition. Or D. Increase your deflection by one. Oh. Somatic ingredients c can grant you either A, one additional, you regenerate one additional vitality whenever you push forward. B, increase your fortitude by one. C, it gain temporary hit points equal to your level. Or D, your chance to automatically hit increases by one. Ooh. Not your chance to crit, your chance to auto hit. So instead of 17 through 20, it becomes 16 through 20. I uh, I think somatic stuff would be real good for uh, an Inquisitor or a Ranger. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And Rift, either A, plus one to ability checks made to perceive or understand the nature of magical effects. B, increase your climb and swim speeds by five feet. D, sorry, C, Ah, increase your movement by five feet, or D, you may remake one roll in the duration of the is of the meal's effect. Is remake? Does that mean you can just change one roll into en into any result, or is it a is it a re-roll? I'm I'm guessing it's probably a re-roll, but yeah, better better uh better phrasing. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then we have four. Then we have um, so. I'd say we're I'd say we're three for three when it comes to the foundation of these kind of, of these kind of effects because um, given this this does mean that that you can't be you can't be ridiculously OP when it comes to cooking but it's certainly not it's certainly not gonna hurt. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the, if he's going to expand that artistry further or make a, a like an advanced version of artistries you can get. That would allow you to use like two components to imbue more secondary effects of different types. Well, we haven't covered feats yet, so hold that thought. True. But but now we get on to forging. Before before I... we get into forging, I I have to I have to put in one rule. If anybody picks anybody in a campaign that we're doing picks um picks picks culinary after the meal, they have to end it with, "You're welcome." What, I can't get one Food Wars joke out of my system? If we if we really if we really want to weave it up, monk, they don't say you're welcome. They say, Oh sluts <laughs> And they have to take off a headband while doing it, yeah. and the rest of the party then has to moan. <laughs> well except, uh, except for what except for one guy who goes through a complete personality change whenever he has his headband on. <laughs> oh fucking Rio. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Anyway, forging. It's time for the dwarf to come back from his forest. I didn't want to leave, goddammit. <laughs> through, th through bitter heat, the hammer falls upon the anvil, shaping the steel. Upon the convergence of the, sta the stars, the staff is sung from the great tree of memories. I didn't sing a staff from a tree. I sang a <laughs> war hammer from a tree. You goddamn knife, you has got it wrong. <laughs> ah! In the dark corner of a forgotten laboratory, eldritch flesh is grown from vats and hardened into a blade. Heavens and Heresies allows characters to play an active part in the forging of their weaponry. Whether it be a spear forged from the spine of a great leviathan... Isn't it an axe? Oh wait, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it an axe, boy? Or or a staff forged from the remnants of a fallen star. This isn't Conan the Adventurer. Nor is it uh, Final Fantasy VII. The character's equipment should be unique and, and should tell a story. Yes, it should. When a weapon or piece of armor is forged or reforged, it loses all previous modifications. Dev note, this needs a bit more, but it's a good starting point. Later I'll add something that deals with resonance, because that will be fun. I may add the ability to switch a weapon into a different weapon, but I am still on the edge. Part of Bad pun! <laughs> Bad pun! <laughs> really, edge Tanner? Saint, <laughs> edge Saint Claus does not approve. Uh, do not pass go. Take a Huckbine 30th full, black, uh, full impact black hole cannon to the face. <laughs> Part of what makes magical items fun is the fact that they force players to act outside of their comfort zone, rather than just further optimizing a build. So I, m I may just have it so forging can switch a weapon from one subtype to another within the same type. Uh, does does this does this mean we can't get gun blades? I was thinking more forging a piece of armor that just is a kind of like a powered exosuit using resonance stuff. But that's just me because I'm a fucking troll. <laughs> uh, no, I uh, I, I look forward to to how this is gonna work. Mm -hmm. So, much like much like with previous times, the quality of the materials used to make the make a item is going to determine the number of modifications. And we have we have our we have the most infamous password when it comes to the when it comes to the qualities. One, two, three, four, five. Three, four, five. That's the password on my luggage. <laughs> so we have we have a set we have a set of modifications for weapons and for armor, and I am getting some serious fantasy craft flashbacks with this shit. <laughs> That's not a that's not a critique though. I've been wanting that for a while. I've been wanting that for a while. That's why we put it in our game. Mm -hmm. Well, using more of the tag system of legend, but still. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, so first we have armor piercing, which grants plus one to threat, but your damage is reduced by one di by one die type. Blech. There's an asterisk for some, for, probably for the note. You may not choose this feature if the weapon would be reduced below 1d2 damage. If you've increased your threat range enough to reduce your, your weapon damage to 1d2, um, I have bad news for you. That's still only like a maximum of 4 damage. Mm -hmm. So, well, plus proficiency, etc. But your base is going to be plus, it's going to be 4. Maybe this is not the modification for you at that point. Yeah. Let's see, lighten redu um, reduces enc reduces encumbrance by one. Doesn't have a pen doesn't have a penalty, but has no effect on weapons with an encumbrance of one. Of course, a weapon will always encumber because, as we discussed over in items and equipment, encumbrance is not about weight. It's about how easy or hard the item is to carry around efficiently. Mm -hmm. Like a 60 pound kayak versus a 60 pound backpack. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let's see. Heavy, the minimum damage increases by one, so it gets, so it gets brutal one. But nice. it increases the encumbrance by one. Which this, makes sense. This cannot rain this cannot increase the minimum damage of a weapon above its maximum damage. 
I mean, that seems kind of obvious, but okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have the weighted end, which ha which grants plus one weapon damage, but a minus one to attack rolls, and its automatic miss range increases by one. So instead of my, of one through four, your automatic miss becomes one through five, mm -hmm. and you and your attack rolls automatically have a minus one. But you know, with all your other mods, that may not really mean much. Yep. <laughs> but that automatic <clears throat> miss range is going to mean is not is going gonna to mean a lot miss. more. That's although, a difference of five percent. Although it's not it's not as much of a deal breaker as it would be in it would be in other games for one reason, combat focus. That and certain classes have the ability to also reduce their, their miss range, remember, Monk? <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Extended reach. So grants an extra five feet of reach, but has a penalty of minus one weapon damage and minus one two threat range. So question, does that mean if you... I'm, I'm guessing that means that if your threat range is above one uh, or above uh, plus one already, like... Because you, you, your threat range is assumed to be 20 mm. initially. And then as you add threat range, you get more. I'm guessing that that minus one to threat range will not reduce you to being unable to hit with criticals. Mm -hmm. And there's a note there about extend to reach. You may only choose this feature once. But I want to use a 20-foot spear. It's not like that's horribly inefficient and not good for war at all or anything. <laughs> Well, didn't you didn't you use a twenty? Didn't you use a twenty? I used a nine the... foot spear, monk. Okay, a nine foot spear, the typical anti cavalry nine foot spear that was then used on infantry more effectively than they thought it would be, and they didn't like me because it wasn't traditional. And I'm like, of course it's traditional. Go look at mainland China in like 2000 BC, and then they really looked at me dirty. The SCA can suck my left ass cheek. Fuck you guys for hating on Eastern uh, period uh, standards. I don't want to delve on this too much, but that is that is something I think we should we should cover one of these days about how 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 SCA and, and to a certain to a certain extent some some people in HEMA have have this have this um have this Eurocentric bias. And we're not using that as a buzzword. Ha ha. Um, yeah, we can cover that in a geek watch someday. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it for a Sunday slot. I'd do that as a special because yeah, the only people who are gonna ha who are gonna have that kind of experience in 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 our group is gonna is you, me, and possibly Tanner. Yeah. Uh, but let's see. Then we have balanced, plus one to attacks and minus one weapon damage, and home. So you hit. Go ahead. So you hit more. And just do slightly less damage. I think that's a good. I think that's a very good trade-off. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, honed does plus one damage, but requires a requires a modification which subtracts damage for each honed modification. And I I just realized, um, take it take a great take a mass weapon, give it give it um he, give it heavy. Weighted end and extended reach, you have the Dragon Slayer. <sighs> Can almost call call it a slab of raw iron, monk. <laughs> is that not what a mass weapon is? I mean his is technically a sword, and he technically swings it fast enough to cut rather than crush things. Anyway, then we get to the armor modification tables. So hardened grants one dr, and do, and has a penalty of minus one tier of HP or, min, or minus one deflection. Armor must be of t with the note of it must be tier two or above. Lighten decreases the encumbrance by one, but this has no effect on armors with encumbrance of one. Flexible grants 10 HP, but reduces your DR or deflection by one, and it must and it must be tier two armor or higher. 
deflecting grants one deflection, but either reduces DR by one by one or HP by ten. And armor must be tier two or above. I'm guessing. I'm guessing that. Th I'm guessing that the H that the HP penalties are specifically to the to if your um, armor grants bonus HP. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Heavy grants plus one DR, but adds to encumbrance. Padded Obviously. adds ten HP, but adds to encumbrance. And glancing adds one deflection, but adds two encumbrance. And I'm guessing, again, you can't add things that <clears throat> aren't already on the armor. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so then we get to rites and rituals. The Description. Yep. <laughs> Rit <laughs> rituals require two free hands in order to perform. And then just a ton of dev notes. I've uploaded, I've uploaded a lot to these recently. I'm not through all of them yet, but here is a sizable chunk so people at least know a good portion of the options in each. Also, since rituals require materials to cast, this is why the simplified encumbrance system is important. It provides a limit on stuff so people aren't casting all the rituals without an opportunity cost, since a, t a tier 2 material will be worth relatively little if you are level 15 and whatnot. The encumbrance system is also a spell slot system. Who could have known they fit together so seamlessly? And hey, it's a spell slot system that doesn't piss us off. And hey, it's a spell slot system that isn't Vancian. And thus doesn't piss us off. We well, admit that Vancian works in the Vance worlds. Come on now. Well, the, f the funny thing about that, you'd think you think that the official dying er you think that the official dying Earth RPG that Pelgrane put out would use it, and it doesn't. <laughs> question was was vance trolling everybody or was the was the company trolling vance the world will never know well the color of magic was meant to troll vance <laughs> so i'd say i'd say it go i'd say it goes all i'd say it's feel it's a feelings mutual kind of thing yeah he goes also i'm working on a way to organize these better i don't like how listy they are so when i get a better handle on them that is definitely on the list of things to do one of the issues is that they have a lot of different things that categorize them, and so would work better as an online compendium, but this is going to be a published book, so I have to work within that framework, such as tier, resonance, duration, etc., etc. Also, right now, a lot of the rituals are placed a little haphazardly. Some rituals in abjuration would make sense in imbuement or, stu or stuff like, like... Like that, I'm mm -hmm. sure. In the more finished version, each ritual type will have an even number of rituals. I might even change the names slash categories of imbuement and abjuration if need be. Also, also, it was a conscious choice to not divide the rituals up based on resonance for a number of reasons. In certain campaigns, some resonances might be more scarce. I want people to be able to utilize their chosen ritual type no matter the setting, though the setting will have impact on what specific rituals from the larger type can be used. But with the resonance system, this ensures that you will always have access to rituals that make sense in a specific setting. If you are in a setting dealing with a lot of mind fuckery, you'll be getting psychic resonance and able to do rituals that fit into the setting. Boom. Absolutely no thought required by the GM or players. Another reason is that I want each artistry to make use of all the resonances, so that was another reason to separate them out like this. Then we have ritual tags. Eventually, this will be in the core rules, but it needs to be here for now, so it's here. Also, these aren't all the tags. He goes, did I mention these are a nightmare to organize? <laughs> Let's see. Encounter. Last the duration of the encounter, or 60 seconds outside of an encounter. Limited. You can only have one instance of the same limited fe active feature at any time. A feature with the limited tag only restricts multiple instances of the same feature. So two different features of the limited tag don't cross don't um crosswire with each other. Minion. Minions take their turn at the end of the initiative order if initiative is being tracked. If a character has multiple groups of minions, minions created by different features, for example, they must choose which minions will act. A character can only command one group of minions at a time. If multiple characters have minions, the minions must Still take their turns at the end of the initiative order if it is being tracked, but each may activate a group of minions. Minions must take must take their actions simultaneously. When one minion makes a move action, 
Each other minion must also take the move action. They can choose to move zero feet, but then they cannot move later in the same turn. This is, tr this is true for any action and quick action they take. For example, if one million minion takes the help action, each minion under the summoner's control can simultaneously take the help action. But one minion cannot take the help action while another takes the attack action. Minions must also make their attacks simultaneously. The caster rolls a single attack using the skill attack bonus for the attack roll. This, this roll is considered the attack roll for each of the attacking minions. I'm not sure if you if you noticed, Monk, but up in Encounter and Limited, he said feature instead of ritual. Yeah, I did see that. I, I kind of skim, kind of skimmed past that. So yeah, uh, I just literally replaced each mm -hmm. each instance. Mm -hmm. Oh, he says I'll streamline slash word this better later. For now, these rules apply to each character's minions separately. So if one player wants to move their minions, but another oh. doesn't doesn't want to move his group, that's not an issue. Players determine whose menu, minion group goes first, etc. Outside of encounters, a caster may give their minion separate orders. Once given an order, the minion continues to follow it until its task is complete. If the caster issues no commands, or the minion completes its task, it only defends itself against hostile creatures. Minions are able to perform simple tasks which their form would normally allow, but it may not perform tasks which would require proficiency. For example, a group of minions could keep watch but not create potions, alchemy, or perform rituals, rites and rituals, or gather information, investigation, on their own. Minions have a carrying capacity relative to their size, and a minion cannot take actions if it is encumbered. So tiny has one, small and medium have two, large have four, and huge have six. A huge minion is a sight, it would be a sight to behold. Especially, I would love to see that. especially huge minions, plural. Let's see. Trigger. Rituals with the trigger tag generally require some, something to occur in order for the feature to activate. Once the resulting conditions are met, the effect of the feature occurs requiring no additional action. And until dispelled, lasts until they are dispelled, either with a ritual such as dispel magic or with other means. Then we have the material cost table. So, so, and it re it relies on the same rarity setup we've seen we've seen all throughout this and in previous setups. So first we well, have he did, he did say it was going to be you know the whole it was going to be a uh, central to basically everything. So, mm -hmm. so first we have abjurations. So we have alarm, which works about how one would expect. It's a psychic resonance. Um, arcane lock, which it, which can be, which can use any resonance. Um, arcane, def arcane deflection, which, gr which grants deflection against spells and spell-like effects. The amount of deflection gain depends on the tier of material, going from plus one all the way up to plus 15. One, three, five, eight, fifteen. Interesting setup. If the material used in this ritual matches that of the spell being cast, the spell attack is made with disadvantage. Let's see. Anti-life <laughs> anti shell. So when not, another creature can't pass through that barrier. Elemental absorption. I can see that one getting some use. Um, let's see. Death ward. Dispel magic. If it if it seems like I'm skimming through these, that's because there's a lot of rituals, and if we were to go through all of them, we'd be here until sunrise. Let's just take a look at the most. Um. But I should note that each of them has the name, the the ritual, and what tier it is, or if it's a vi or if it's a variable tier. The prep time, the required resonance, the target, the range, and the duration is how these work. But if yeah. you if you've been playing if you've <clears throat> messed around with a spell book at any point in time, a lot of these are going to be familiar to you, and it's it's not it's not trying to reinvent the wheel with a lot of the effects, it's just it's just putting them in the context of Heavens and Heresy's system. Um, magic cir magic circle does what you, does what you'd expect. 
And that, there's a dev note with Magic Circle saying, so Heavens and Heresies isn't going to categorize creatures like this, so I'm working on a different way to do so. Ballistic creatures here are more of a band-aid, so it's usable in the games I run. Let's see, non-detection. Oh. Planar protection. Private sanctum. Tiny hut. Vow of pacifism. Oh. I really liked... Uh, Private Sanctum. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I'd say it... I'd, I'd say it's basically Hallow. Oh. I mean, kind of. Although it has... Although it has multiple... Um, it, it, is te it is technically that, but there's a whole... But there's other factors with it. Um, since you... You can decide what you can decide what security the ritual provides. It could either be sound can't pass through the barrier. Um, the barrier it appears dark and foggy, preventing vision through it, including dark vision. Sensors created by divination spells can't appear in inside the re the protected area or pass through the barrier. Creatures in the area can't be targeted by divination. Nothing can teleport into or out of the warded area, or or planar travel is blocked. And you can choose all of them. Mm -hmm. And I like the last tag, though. This ritual only affects creatures whose challenge rating is equal to or below the tier of material used in it. And, it, and it's a ritual that starts at tier 3. So, uh, Performing this ritual in the same spot every day for a week makes the effects permanent. So with 7 materials and 7 days to perform it, it's permanent. And the ritual can only be m dispelled using the Dispel Magic ritual and an equal amount of time and materials. Uh, the ritual fails if it targets an area already infected by an imbuement ritual. Mm -hmm. I like the Private Sanctum ritual. That's just a really cool... That's right there. That's a, that's It has a bunch of utility. But even better, there's a narrative reason to use this. There's, there, there are plenty of times where you're going to want want to have your safe house, depending on the type of campaign you're in that this is going to be super useful to just have like your wizard or your or one of your other casters be like yo we've got all this tier three material just you you guys have rites and rituals could you uh could you cast this every day while we're here sure after seven days they don't have to cast it anymore that's so cool that's so cool So, nah, so I already mentioned Tiny Hut, Val Pacifism, Warding Bond, um, and z Zone of Zone of Truth. Al although what I like what I like in this version of Zone of Truth is much like Compel, you can choose to ignore it and take damage. Although a legendary <laughs> a legendary tier does twelve d twelve damage. Holy shit! Let me ro let me roll that. That's a fucking gross of damage if you max it out. Um, I just did a random ass roll of that. That's eighty three. <laughs> is what I that's, rolled. That's gonna kill most humanoids. <laughs> that's gonna that's gonna kill most humanoids at twentieth level. Mm hmm. So yeah, best not best best tell the truth. <laughs> oh, and that's each time. And I, I take, I take it back. With, with compel, you can choose to ignore, ignore the compulsion and take damage. Whereas this, you take damage each time you lie. You tell a lie, and you're gonna take damage. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you had a compulsion on somebody to tell lies, and they were hit with a legendary zone of truth. That's a death that's a death sentence. Well, I mean they can clear the compulsion by ignoring it. But then they take psychic damage from that too. Mm-hmm. Oh good shit. Yep. Let's see, then we have divination rituals. So we have augury. Works works how you'd expect. Clairvoyance. Which has both sensor as 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 tier two or arcane eye as tier three. 
requires a elemental aether resonance. Um, commune. Jeez, now I'm getting L5R flashbacks when I'd play Shugenja. <laughs> commune with <laughs> commune with nature is a tier three divination ritual. So our so our dwarf probably our dwarf probably has that a lot. Hmm. I mean, he probably has a has that just to find out um the best places to sing some of the best metals from the ground. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Comprehend comprehend languages. Again, so again, self-explanatory. It's tier one, and it's a four-hour duration. That's pretty fucking good. Um. Let me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Um. Detect planar. Which which works about how do you how we'd expect detect poison and disease detect thoughts, legend lore, i.e. i.e. bardic knowledge but useful. Um, it could also, it could also be the, it could also be the Gaia bookshelves. Eh. Gaia memories, what? Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see, locate creature or plant, locate object, omen, scry, speak with dead, speak with plants, telepathic bond, and tongues. See, then Tongues have... is, is detect language given to other people. Mm -hmm. And it's only one hour. Yeah. Then we have malediction rituals. Which is curses. <laughs> Quick and dirty clarification slash ideas. You can set the triggers for a curse and for its release. Things like the cursed creature is compelled to attempt to kill the king for curses which require goals. The creature is able to take care of its basic needs, eating, sleeping, and otherwise fitting into society in order to help themselves achieve the goal, but feel the effects of the compulsion every time they do something that would hinder the goal, rather than every time they do something that does not, fur that does not further their goal. You may also set a condition for the curse's release. For example, one could curse someone with the curse of frailty, with the release trigger being kidnapping the noble son and bringing him to a set location. The curse can still be cured normally, but also ends when the person fulfills the task. Curses should add flavor to a game. In fact, all of these rituals are meant to add flavor to the narrative. The PCs find an assassin who is plotting to kill the king and him, only to find out later that he was magically cursed and did not have the means to uncurse himself. That type of thing is super fun and adds a lot of life to the game. I hate it when games create features then pretend those features don't exist. Don't we all? Mm-hmm. Don't we fucking all? It's not like, you know, skill systems are useful or anything, right, Monk? <laughs> <sighs> um, fuck you, 3.5. Eat shit and die. Mm -hmm. oh. so, so, they can yeah. mal in my dictus. A little, a little bit too, a little bit easy, but okay. Um, so we have antipathy slash sympathy, and antipathy ca causes creatures of the kind you designated to feel an intense urge to leave the area and avoid the target, or sympathy, an intense urge to approach the target while within in, <laughs> within the area. Um, this requires a darkness resonance, has a duration of one day and a prep time of four hours. Is darkness reusable, or sh is, do we only sacrifice her once? <laughs> I don't know. How many phoenix feathers do you have? That's a good question. We could all... Um, well, we know we know a so-called phoenix. We could always beat him up and steal his feathers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna need your feathers, and unfortunately, your compliance is not a factor. Unfortunately, don't you mean fortunately? Yes, 
Because remember, folks, violence is not the answer. Violence is the question, and the answer is yes. It would normally be about this time that somebody would pro inevitably post the meme of, are we the baddies? Monk and I don't have to ask that question. We absolutely are. <laughs> Does this mean I'm gonna have to? Does this mean at, Does this mean the next time we're at a convention, I'm gonna have to walk around with a with a toothpick and doing a and doing a bad Cuban accent, saying, "Say hello to the bad guy." And I don't know. You don't have the complexion for that. No, although he is nah. from my state. Also true. <laughs> um, let's see. Then we have blinding curse as the. As an additional cost to, th to this ritual, you must obtain an object which the target values or or an object which they would regularly touch and observe. The target becomes cursed, and until the effects of the curse are lifted, they are blinded by an amount equal to twice the tier of the material used. Which is why a legendary tier would blind ten them, which is, in, which is maximum severity. Mm -hmm. it's well, so... I see that that's another darkness ritual, and I can understand why darkness would blind people. <laughs> she is such a masochist. Mm -hmm. uh, charm person. What? And you need a per you need a personal item on that on that front. They are cursed, and are com and are compelled by an amount equal to two oh, equal to twice the tier of the material used. Each time the target interacts with the trigger, the severity is reduced by two. And the severity of the curse is reset between rests. Um, <laughs> imagine a legendary charm person being cast, and that and the person being cursed choosing to take the psychic damage. Oof, that's ten d six. Yup. See, curse of curse of frailty. You need a vi you need a vial of either the target's blood or spit. The target is cur the target is cursed and for and for the duration is vulnerable by twice the tier of the material. Um, lethargy does this does the same thing except weakened. Dream. The ritual shapes a creature's dreams, and as an additional cost, you must obtain an article of clothing the target has slept in, or a pillow, bedsheet, or other such item. That the target has slept on slash with, um, that the tar that if it weren't for the if it other other such I other such item, um, this is get this is gonna be a special level of hell for couples. Um, no. <laughs> okay, because... no. Okay, no, it wouldn't be, but st <laughs> but still. No, it's it's a it's a special level of hell. For those with battery-operated boyfriends. <laughs> Just rem remember, folks, do not fist android girls. You do realize the Yorha androids are canonically designed to be as biologically functional as possible, right? I know, I just had to make- I just had to meme. Yeah, well... That didn't stop Rule 34 artists. <laughs> nothing, nothing is going to stop Rule 34 artists. You know this. To quote... Where did, where did I... This is a meme from long, long ago. Dick penis into robot! <laughs> uh, this is why I'm glad I'm not monetized. And I never <laughs> will be. <laughs> An ad will an advertiser. The only advertisers that would agree to put ads on your videos are are, uh, are sex toy uh, manufacturers. Anyway, next next is elemental ruin. As an additional cost, you must procure some earth from the shoes of of the target, some ash from their hearth or fire pit, or a container from which they have drank. The target becomes cursed, and they're vulnerable to affliction by the corresponding element. By an amount equal to twice the tier. So does this mean that this uh this particular ritual is unique to Ravagers? Mm. I can hear I can hear the screaming, monk. Mm. 
<laughs> anyway, hallucinatory terrain. You make natural terrain look, sound, and smell like some other sort of natural terrain. Thus, open fields or a road can be made to resemble a swamp, hill, crevice, or some other difficult or impassable terrain. A pond may be made to look like a grassy meadow, a precipice like a gentle slope, or a rock-strewn gully like a wide and smooth road. Manufactured yes. structures, equipment, and creatures within the area aren't changed in appearance. The tactile characteristics of the terrain are unchanged, so creatures entering the area are likely to see through the illusion. Physical interaction with the with the image reveals it to be an illusion, because things can pass through because things can pass through it. If a creature interacts with the illusion in any way, it may make a wits check against your spellcasting defense to discern the illusion for what it is. If a creature discerns the illusion for what it is, the creature can see through the image. And its other sensory qualities to become faint to the cr to the creature. The quality determines its duration. So uncommon, a day. Rare, a week. Very rare, a month. Legendary, until dispelled. This is the ki this is the kind of curse that pe that people put on their tr on their um on their treasure. This is the kind of curse people put on their moats. Oh, you can approach my castle easy. We don't even have a drawbridge. It's just an open gate. Charge into my 50-foot moat because 20 feet is never enough, and I never understand why they only dig 20 feet. Mm -hmm. Next we have Imprisonment. A magical restraint to hold a creature that you can see within range. Make a skill attack against their intuition defense. On a hit, the creature is bound by the ritual. If the attack misses... The creature is immune to this ritual un if you perform it again within a 24-hour period. While affected, they don't need to breathe, eat, or drink, and they don't age. Divination rituals can't locate or perceive the target unless they're the same tier as this ritual. It's and Oblivion it's Ring! Or right? Detention Sphere, mm -hmm. depending on which card you like better. Detention yep. Sphere is honestly better. You choose, you, choose wit, you choose one of the following forms of imprisonment. The chosen form determines the ritual is required resonance. So we have burial, chaining, hedged prison, which which transports them into a tiny demiplane that is warded against teleportation and planar travel. It can be a labyrinth, a cage, a tower, or a similar confined structure. Like I said, it's 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 fucking oblivion ring. I was gonna go with either that or the labyrinth from Hellraiser. The Marchand's configuration. Mm -hmm. Fun, fun. Um, Mac, um, minimus containment. <laughs> Phenomenal cosmic power. Itty bitty living space. space. <laughs> um, slumber. So for so one so not exact not exactly dissuading the Disney jokes. Hmm. Tags lim tags limited, so that means that you can't put someone in a labyrinth and put them to sleep. You can't put them in in an. You can only have one thing imprisoned at a time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Major major image, basically an, basically a major illusion. Um, marking, marking cur curse. curse. You have to obtain an object which the target might distinguish themselves. A fancy hat, a ring, or an engraved sword are all such items. They are cursed, and until the curse is lifted, they are marked by an amount equal to twice the material used. So you have messenger. Command an animal to deliver a message. Choose a tiny beast you can see, such as a squirrel, a blue jay, or a bat. You specify a location, which you must have visited, and a recipient who matches the general description. You also speak a message of up to 25 words. The target beast travels for the duration of the spell toward the specified location, covering 50 miles every 24 hours. When it arrives, it delivers your message to the creature that you described, replicating the sound of your voice. The messenger speaks only to a creature matching the description you gave. If the messenger can't reach its destination or dies, the message is lost. Why do we get the feeling our dwarf would send this to the Elf Queen every, every, time, he, every time he sees soldiers specifically to tell her to fuck off? Um... No, you see, he'd do it in a way that would really piss her off. Um, he 
he wouldn't just apply messenger. He'd apply messenger to an animal the elves hate. And he'd and he'd apply a curse to a uh, to compel them to do things. And so the first thing that this animal does when it gets there is shit on her shoes. Then it sends his message. <laughs> Or shit in the scrying pool. Shit in her personal pool. <laughs> Let's see. Because we need to make it explicitly clear, our dwarf really does not like elves. Oh, boy. <laughs> they told him he couldn't be a druid, that he wasn't allowed. He didn't like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Mirage... Make terrain in an area up to one mile squ into a, of, of a one mile square feel like even feel like other some other sort of terrain. No wonder this is tier four. Uh, and it's and it's until dispelled if it's tier five if it's legendary. Yep. Let's see, then we have modify memory. What? <laughs> which is tier a tier three thing. Oh. Uh, you know, Legendary, any time in the creature's past. Holy fuck. Um, you remember the Neuralizer from Men in Black? What's a Neuralizer? <laughs> Who are you again? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, then we have Petrify. So, so self-explanatory th self there. Although it does... See. And la the last one is Plague. And as an additional cost, you must bury a fully intact corpse of a marked soul in the area you wish to inflict. The corpse must be buried no more than one feet below the ground. Removing the corpse does not remove the curse, but if one attempts to nullify the curse without first removing the body, they must use the material one tier above that, w that used in this ritual. Um, does that mean that it would? Does that mean that it'd be impossible? Does that mean you, actually it's it's kind of it's kind of answered? But you afflict an area with one of the following plagues. The chosen plague determines the ritual's material requirement. So either insects afflicted with swarms of insects, everything the area is obs obscured. Blight crops wilt and do not bear produce, and creatures within the area cannot procreate. Oh, and creatures are... Kachanka, is that you? <laughs> um, misfortune. Wounds suffered in this area are treated as curses rather than normal wounds. Undeath. Creatures that die within the affected area rise as zombies, which are hostile to all other creatures, including the one who performs this ritual, except other zombies created by this ritual. And madness. Creatures within the area are confused once every hour while in the area. Um, there's a cert there's a certain irony that I could see happening with the undeath curse. You know, somebody cre somebody creating um sh somebody creating shambling zombies and then getting eaten by his own zombies, and then him himself becoming a shambling zombie because he died there. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> I would like to point out this is something we haven't really covered in depth. And this was something that Tanner told me about a long time ago when he talked about some of his... He actually told me about the plague, the plague ritual months ago. Um, Marked Soul is the name for a player character. It's an in-universe explanation of, of how people get classes and become more than just a normal citizen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be expanded on further in the lore sections of of this of the book, which he still is writing up. So basically, you have to bury the fully intact corpse of someone who had a class, mm -hmm. someone who is not a normal citizen, whether that's an NPC that has class statistics or whether that's another player. Um, you have to have that to do this. So then we get to evocation rituals. Rituals that evoke soul-like energy into objects such as constructs or corpses. Necromancy is a subset of evocation. 
and goes dev note going to revamp the artistry and streamline it between four main types of minions undead constructs plants and beasts each minion will be able to be given different passive and active features based on its type why does that sound familiar i don't know monk let's see there will be two <laughs> main types of minions packs and singular singular minions are for things like golems or big things Packs are for things like skeletons or swarms or things like that. Every tier of material will get you a certain amount of traits, which can be spent on things like increasing the number of creatures for pack creatures, making creatures overall tougher, giving creatures neat little abilities. There will be four subtypes of minions. We already mentioned these. Each subtype will have some exclusive traits available to that specific subtype. There will also be universal traits available to any subtype. Unlike animal companions, minions don't have compulsions, but they have a lot less utility than the animal companions. They will also require the, ma the maker to carry something which allows the creator to control them, so they cost encumbrance. So you're telling me I can now four-pool Zerg Rush. Got it. <laughs> and anyone who doesn't get that reference, I've dated myself. Wouldn't be the first time we did. Then we and have... a four-pool Zerg Rush is an old term. Then we have um, Restoration Rituals, Rituals That Cure or Rejuvenate. Dev note, Resurrection doesn't exist in Heavens and Heresies. Thank you. With all the features allotted to a character and the protections against death in this game, it can be hard to come by. For me, this was an explicit choice as a developer. I want death to be rare, but I want it to occur, hence the death flag mechanic. And when it does occur, I want it to have meaning and impact. Resurrection robs it of its impact. Of course, I don't think that's I don't think that's not to say that the GM can't bullshit a character coming back to life if if needed, but um, that should be a GM call kind of thing instead of throwing around raised de instead of throwing around raised dead. Yeah, that's that's that there is a is a GM fiat situation, and it in in a game where explicitly resurrection should not be occurring, that sort of GM fiat needs to be some sort of maybe culmination of the campaign type thing. Mm -hmm. Like, you've, you've, you're all at level 20, you, maybe you went and fought a god, and so another god award, awarded you with something outside of anything that a, that a person can do. Yeah. Uh, so first we have Restoration. A creature you touch is cured of one cures, curse, wound, or disease aff afflicting it. The quality and the resonance of the used material must match that of the curse. For a curse, the ritual practitioner must have access to a sacred space, such as a temple, hallowed area, or grove, in order to purge the curse. And then we, and then we have the material qualities, which determines the severity of the wound, curse, or disease. Um, so, common, two or less, uncommon, four or less, rare, six or less, very rare, eight or less, and legendary, any. In addition to the qu um, quality of the required sacrifice, the resonance of the used material will determine what kinds of what kinds can be removed. In the in the case with m of multiple conditions, the highest severity condition or a condition which is tied for high severity requires determines the required resonance. Psychic cure can cure compel and confusion. Elemental can can cure afflicted based on the based on the specific subset. Light can cure hidden, blinded, and marked. Somatic can cure vulnerable and weakened, and rift can cure hindered and stunned. Then we have imbuement rituals, devoted to bestowing new qualities on objects or spaces. Let's see, we have alter self. Let's see, and sit. It's about a, mm -hmm. what you would consider on the tin. Mm -hmm. um, so this is for your Master of Disguise people. Artificial Death. Once again, exactly what it says on the tin. Avenging Ward. <laughs> oh, this is an interesting one. When a creature strikes the target with a melee attack, the Avenging Ward will lash out and damage the creature. The ward fades after the first time the target is struck with a melee attack. The damage type matches that of the material's resonance, 
and its damage is dependent on its tier. So 2d6, 4d6, 68, 8d10, or 12d12. Currently working. This sounds. On... This sounds like something that you wouldn't put on a party member, but on someone you're trying to protect. Yeah. Or, or if you, or if the party wants to be a dick, put this on the tank against the big bag. Put a legendary level on the tank against the big bag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hit you. Oh God! Twelve d twelve damage. What the fuck? <laughs> Let's see, awaken grants a beast or a plant of your choice sentience. Ay 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 This is one I could definitely see the uh, our dwar our dwarf ca our dwarf casting. But remember, Ents are stupid and too slow. You're right. He would raise the rocks. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, no. No, no, he, it's plants. So, um, he might he, would... he, he might use this to ra to raise v to raise Venus flytraps to have them sing. Sing, right? <laughs> they they'll be singing the every shanty song from here to Timbuktu. <laughs> what the hell is a Timbuktu? I don't know. It's a nonsense word I made up. Because <laughs> Timbuktu doesn't exist in this world, so. Um, just made it up for effect. Yeah. Let's see, contin continual flame, which is about what you'd expect. So it's so it's the way to it's the way to pull a torch out of your ass when you don't have one. It's also not a morvable flame, so we're good. Mm -hmm. And anyone who doesn't get that joke hasn't ever seen bad translations of Gundam. Mm -hmm. Let's see, darkness. Does exactly Brothers, what darkness. You, does ex exactly what you think it would. Um, no, th this next one is one that our dwarf would use. And yeah. he'd use it on the elves every fucking time. Yep. If, even if the elves had humans or anyone else with them, it would be the elves first, unless the elves had somehow teamed up with dw other dwarves. Then it would be the dwarves first. <laughs> Because he'd be like, what are you doing helping them naivers? What are you even doing in my forest? Get the fuck out, all of you! Before I set you all on fire! But this is a forest. My forest is immune to fire. You are not. <laughs> uh, yeah, entangling ground, infl inflicts hindered, based on the tier of the material used. A tier one is inflicts hindered two on a twenty-five foot square, whereas tier whereas a legendary entangling ground would inflict hindered six on a five hundred foot square. Alternatively, you may choose to move the plants in such a way that they are protected from the elements and enriched beyond their normal yield capacity. Rather than hindering, the plants themselves, not those that eat them, are considered to be soothed instead and their yield is quadrupled. Oh, he definitely used Entangling Ground both to fuck with people and to farm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Illusory Aura. Place an illusion on a creature or an object you touch so divination and inquiries ref into it reveal no false information about it. So you either choose... So you have False Aura and or Mask as your options. Which both do what you would think on there. Mm -hmm. Mask is one of the ways that you get rid that you get past the Inquisitor's sixth sense. Yep. Um, general repose protects a creature from decay. Let's see, grove um, does what you, does what you would ex what you would expect and has some and has some stuff that I'm pretty sure our dwarf would enjoy, such as um, solid fog, so that so to so ambush the elves, grasping undergrowth. To hinder the elves, um, barbed brambles to stab the elves, and make them bleed. Mm -hmm. You'll water me plants with your blood knife ears. <laughs> numbing po numbing pollens to to weak to weak to numb their senses. This and it only it only affects creatures and effects whose challenge rating or tier is equal to or below the tier of the material used in it. I want to know. Can general repose um, prevent corpses in a undead plague land from rising as zombies? That's what I want to know. 
Yeah, or does the zombification occur instantaneously? Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have Hallow, which which does most of what one would expect. Although it's got some interesting things it can do, like like binding some extra effects. You choose two effects from the following list. The GM may provide an additional additional effect options as as necessary. Um, let's see, we have Courage. The, you, you can't be frightened. Darkness. So Hidden Six fills the area. Daylight. Bright light fills the area, dispelling all severity of the hidden condition caused by darkness. Energy Protection. Resistance to one elemental damage type. Energy Vulnerability. Vulnerable to one elemental damage type. Everlasting Rest. Dead bodies can't be turned into undead. Extra Dimensional Interference. Can't... Um, they can't can't move or travel using teleportation or by extra dimensional or or interplanar means. Fear. Affected creatures of are, courage. Are, are yep are frightened, applying for severity of conditions which best describe the fear the ritual in, invokes. Silence. No sound can emanate from the area, and no sound can reach into it. Tongues. Creatures can communicate with any other creature in the area, even if they don't share a common language. And forbiddance. They're afflicted to um, damage type Hello. is one, if they end their turn within the within the affected area. And and just like the just like previously, casting this in the same spot for a week makes it permanent. Mm -hmm. Wonder if I wonder if he'd use this kind of thing to um, to fu to fuck around with to fuck around with elves. Holy ground, Highlander. <laughs> Uh, let's see, magic mouth. Yeah, that which works as it usually does, and that's when I can definitely see our druid, our dwarven druid using. Implant a magic mouth all the way from his forest directly to to, to, to the castle of the elves in the queen's own throne. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Make it so when the armies on the march, they're just hearing cheers the entire time. <laughs> I could see him doing that. Yeah. Let's see, program program delusion, which works about as you'd expect. Project image, a illusory copy of yourself, also known as the also known as the Sun Goku method. Oh, fun. Um, silence. So. A, in a a a zone of silence and what and lastly water breathing and that's all the imbuement rituals. Trans iteration rituals. Because he had to sound smart. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Tanner is smart, so yep. like using trans iteration as a word is pretty cool. So we have create or destroy water. It would be really dickish to do this to some to do this to somebody's drink just as they're just, or somebody's um gourd just as they're about to drink from it. It's more dickish to control water and splash it on their face. Mm -hmm. Yep, so control water is de is definitely for those who want a bit of water bending. Um, control weather. Yep. Um, control wind for those who want air bending. Let's see, day daylight. Um, I could see, I could see, I could see a cleric who hunts vampires using this. Thirty foot sphere of bright daylight. You create a a, a magical sun that's only in light quality. Yeah, I'd do it. Mm -hmm. And it even says this light is considered sunlight for the purposes of creatures weak to sunlight. Daylight. And all of a sudden, all the vampires hate you. Yep. Let's see, Dem um, demi plane, which which is is doing a whole pocket dimension. Then we, ha then we have its weaker version in dimension door. So for those who want to do teleporting, um, dense fog, uh, demi door. Mm -hmm. So for so for those who for those who want to cosplay as the shadow. Let's see. And no, that is not Al the Edge, the Shadow. We're talking about something, somebody else entirely. 
Learn your history, people. Let's see. Etherealness. You step into the ethereal plane. So, fly. Oh, yeah. The spell, the spell that provided the basis for the up button, which I think could actually be used here. I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't have to rely on GM Fiat to do the up button in this case. I mean, fly is a prep time of one action too, so it's actually not that slow. All you need is a wind, uh, an elemental wind resonance, and one action's worth of time, and now you're flying. Mm -hmm. For the next ten minutes. Granted, that du that duration is not as long as the up as the up button had, but GMs could fi GMs can still fiat that. Yep. Let's see, freedom of freedom of movement. So for those who want to cheat their way into parkour, um, <laughs> meteor swarm is a ritual, which it as it should be. Why is he using the wrong? Wrong form of reins. And it's a tier 5 ritual, as it should be. And creatures and objects take 20 d10 fire damage on a hit, or half as much on a miss. But the target's only an 80-foot circle. However, the range is one mile. Mm -hmm. I choose an 80-foot circle in the throne room of that castle half a mile away. That is, uh, my, I rolled 20d10 and got 125 damage. Oh, the king's dead. We just assassinated his ass with a meteor swarm. Hey, it's, it, hey, nobody, nobody can notice if nobody's left alive to notice. Well, nobody knows who cast the ritual either. Mm -hmm. We made damn sure to make sure we were in a zone that, that couldn't be auguried or otherwise divined. Yep. Let's see, then we have Passwall. Does what we does what we'd expect. Um, portal. Now you're thinking with portals. I was gonna say this was a triumph. Mm -hmm. Rope trick. Again, once again, uh, once again, as ex once again as expected. Um, secret chest. You hide a chest and all its contents into a small demi plane. Um, this would be a good way to have um, to have ha to. To allow to allow for pe allow for people to have some sort of ability to pack without needing to lug around a pack mule. I noticed this doesn't have a limited tag. You can have multiple secret chests. Yeah, so so I would imagine our sommelier has that has this ritual a lot all over the place. Just stashes, just stashes everywhere. And all he has to do is recast it every month. Mm -hmm. Let's see, sequester. So a, a will basically hi, basically hide a creature, i.e., once again the sommelier would probably be using this on himself to, in any time things got too hot. Mm -hmm. um, spider climb does exactly what you'd think. Although d although um, if anybody's using spider climb, do they do they have to shout at shocker? <laughs> see. Here's an here's another ritual that our that our uh, gnome or that our dwarf would use. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, tree stride, move moving it moving into and out moving into and out of tre and out of trees <clears throat> of the same kind within five hundred feet. Yep. So that's a good way for him to hit and run. Let's see, teleportation circle, transport via plants. Another one that he would that he would probably use. Um, Magical link between tw between a large or larger inanimate plant within range and another plant at any distance on the same plane of existence. You must have seen or touched the destination plant at least once before, and it must have a reputation ascribed to it. Holy shit! He could use this to get into the queen's uh, bedchamber anytime he wanted. <laughs> the castle's made from trees, what do you expect? Mm -hmm. It has a reputation, it's the fucking castle of the elves! And word of, rec word of recall... 
So you, um, you and up to five willing creatures instantly teleport to a previously designated sanctuary and appear in the nearest unoccupied space to the spot you designated when you prepared your sanctuary. Um, why am I remi why am I reminded of a, of a lot of the a lot of the tele a lot of the um, teleport outside the dungeon or teleport to the last te to the last town um, things we'd things we'd see back in the day. Because that's what this is. Mm -hmm. And lastly, water walk. Was Jesus a ninja? Yes, Naruto. Jesus was a ninja. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, I like the fact that if the if in in our theoretical world the castle of the elves is a giant tree. That means each and every room in it is all part of that tree. He can appear anywhere in the tree mm -hmm. and go back to his home forest anytime he wants. Even if he's being chased by the guards, all he has to do is touch the tree with an elemental earth uh, resonance of tier three, and then he disappears. Mm hmm. And they're like, wait, what? And he's like, bye. I'll see you knife ears next time. And all they hear is laughter as he passes into the wood. Um, the, this, the other, th given that, ele given that earth is also an element and that, and, and the whole repu and the whole reputation thing, I just realized something with some of the rich, with some of the rituals here. You could have a situation where the sommelier you never you never you never try and find the sommelier if you want to do business with him. He will find you. Yep. So imagine a part imagine a party going up going up to their room their room at the inn and let and let's let's say the let's say the herald um walks in, walks into his bedroom and all of a sudden there's a sommelier that the sommelier is just sta is just standing there. That's not very nice. <laughs> like, I heard you want. I heard you wanted to do bi just with a. I heard you wanted to do business with me. Well, here I am. I could have come to your shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but for some for somebody who tries to make him for tries to make himself <laughs> as as um hard to find as possible, that's certainly one way to do it. Yeah. His shop is just the place you drop off the orders. Mm -hmm. And you only drop them off with his familiar. Yep. If it sounds if it sounds like if it sounds like the sommelier, we're turning the sommelier into the sh into the shadow broker. Um I mean, didn't we already compare him to the merchant from RE4 though? Yeah. What do you yeah, there's cer there's certainly that. Um, but when as far as as far as artistry is obviously obviously the artistry present here is very raw. But from what from what I'm seeing, I see a I see a very strong foundation. The only I'd say the only concern that I have the only concern that I have is a concern that a concern that I have with a lot of magic systems. And that is having 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 ritual having in this case ritual overtake the overtake the page count size compared to other artistries. Yeah, but he did say that he was looking to streamline them as he play tests them. Mm -hmm. So it's I'd say it's I'd say it's very po I'd say it's very possible that a lot of a lot of the a lot of say the curses that it that inflict that inflict a certain severity. I could see the I could see those getting blended. Yeah, and also, uh, unlike the spells and their page count and how each is a different list or supposed to be a different list for a different, uh, especially in fifth, a different class list. Um, these are accessible to everyone. Anyone can get artistries, including the rituals artistry. Mm-hmm. So this do, this does mean that 
the fan the fantasy of the of the dru of the um ranger who knows a few who knows a few druid spells here and there um can be can be done i i say it can be done a significantly more easier here because of the fact that isn't that in doing so it's not going to be it's not going to be outclassed by an actual druid you can just take a few dru you can take just a few druid themed um Ritual, rituals from the ritual list, and you'd pretty much have that fantasy covered. If you want to, of course, there's no reason that you have to take that route. Yeah, rangers don't have to be casters, Ash. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> but I would say I I would say um one that I'd be one that I'd be looking forward to seeing. Seeing how how to how to expand it is forging, because there is um there is one there is one angle I could see expand I could see br being brought into when it comes to forging, and that is for that is for that is um some this is something that is done in um in fantasy craft and I think you could apply just as well here. Specific for specific forging based on based on certain ancestries, because obviously the way an el a a sword forged by elves and a sword and a sword forged by um by or by humans or by, or by dwarves are going to have different designs and different set and different inclinations. And that might be something he'll he'll consider as well. Mm -hmm. um, he said he already wanted to play around with resonances and see how that would affect things with it too. Like 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 he said, and like we've seen here, it's it's the foundation. Mm -hmm. This is a strong building block from which the rest of the artistries can flourish. Yeah. Um, and I'm, yet I'm, again, hitting it out of the park. Yeah. When it comes to forging, I'm not saying steal from fantasy craft, but um... Steal from fantasy craft. <laughs> <sighs> I knew that well, joke was coming. Well, Crafty Games hasn't been doing anything with it. This is true. Crafty Games has been making board games. But uh, ultimately, I I find some of these rituals to just be like I said. He he said they're supposed to be narrative, and they're a way to interact with the game the game world in not just a mechanical way, but a narrative way. Uh, and all the little, you know, bullshit we've been coming up with from the sommelier and the druid just here. You can see how easily it slots in the narrative. It's not hard to take this this framework and slot it in a narrative. Um, it still has mechanical mechanical benefits too, so it's not like you're doing it just for narrative's sake. And it feels fun. It's varied. It's... Uh, it's got some really powerful things that can occur, depending on if you've got the right materials for it. Like, modify memory. I'm sorry, but that's fucked. That is... That is a... That is a powerful curse. Uh, and it's all... It's all super fun to see this basis, this, this foundation. Because, really, the only direction is the sky. Mm -hmm. outer space at this point and I want to see where he runs with it yeah I, I can I can certainly see that um next next time I'm since I'm not I'm not sure if we're gonna be doing this on Christmas Eve <laughs> we will be tackling feats and I would like to note how very thankful I am that we are not dealing with that bullshit of you have to choose between a feat or ASI. Yep, everything occurs at specific points. And you'll get your feats and your ASIs, and, and some of your class features will even be their own ASIs mm -hmm. that are really fun. Uh, as a quick review, I do want to see... Uh... So the feats section, once it finishes loading, looks to be 
27 pages. So not a, not as long as this. Yeah, we skimmed over a lot of the a lot of the rituals because going over them one by one would have got would have one gotten redundant quick, and, and two, two we've been here for another two hours. Mm -hmm. And this is our this is already long enough as it is. <laughs> uh, it's not as long as my beard yet, though, boy. <laughs> But with the, with that set with that said, we will see we will see you we will see you here either in, either next week or in two or in two weeks depending on, depending on how drunk we are. And very drunk. Un, so un, until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>